Okay. We have been going through a series that I've entitled Ordering Your World. We began with ordering your relationship with God because that is our most important relationship. We want that to be foundational. Then we went from there to ordering your relationship with other believers, our fellowship with other believers. Uh, the next week we went on to ordering your marriage, living our marriage according to God's instructions for our marriage. Last week we had a three-hour semin seminar bilingual in both English and Spanish on ordering your parenting. And if you missed that or uh, you didn't get a chance to, to uh, get the information, we do have a few copies of the transcript of it in both English and Spanish on that back table as you leave. You can pick that up. So that was last week. This week, we move on to uh, the fifth point, and that is ordering your finances. Now, uh, some of you are thinking, boy, I chose to come to church on the Sunday he was preaching on money. Uh, <laughs> but uh, God has a lot to say about money, a lot to say about money. And uh, someone has said, has written, that there are over 3,000 references in Scripture to either money or material possessions. And so we need to be looking at what does God say about ordering our finances. The God who created everything certainly knows how to handle the things that he's given us, doesn't he? And so we're going to be looking at some important principles that we find in God's word that will help us to kind of understand uh, God's desire for us financially. The first principle that I want to introduce is what I call the provision principle. The provision principle basically uh, is the understanding that God is the provider of everything we have. God is our provider. Now, I know there's been, there's been a whole lot of hoopla about uh, you didn't make that or you didn't create that or whatever. That's irrelevant. Uh, but what we want to look at here is the reality is everything we have even the things we think we have title to or that we have earned ourselves, all of it comes from God. It is all part of God's provision. Let's look at 1 Chronicles chapter 29. It's in the Old Testament in verses 11 through 12. And as we look at that passage, uh, th just to give you a little bit of background on this passage, uh, David had been uh, king or was king of Israel. And he was coming to the very end of his reign, and he looked around himself and he said, you know, I've got this wonderful palace that I built for myself, but God doesn't have a house, and God ought to have his own house of worship. And so he went to God and he said, God, I want to build a house of worship for you. I want to build a temple. And God said, no, you can't. And the reason God said, no, you can't, is because David had been a man who had sinned against God by taking another man's life. He had been guilty of murder. And so God said, you have blood on your hands. I'm not going to allow you to make the temple. And then David said, well, but what about my son? And God said, well, your son Solomon will be the one who builds the temple. And David came back again. He said, God, I've got one more question for you. Could I take up an offering to get all the money that's needed to build the temple so I can do that much for Solomon before I before I turn things over to him? And God said, go ahead. And so David sent the message out among the people to, for everyone to bring their offering for the building of the temple together in, in one place. And this is his response to that. He says, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Everything we have comes from God. Everything comes from God. Now, we're going to see in a little bit that the offering was so large 
that David had to tell people, stop bringing things. We've got more than we need. I've never seen a pastor say, stop bringing offerings. We have more than we need. But um, David had, had to do that. Now, in this, uh, particularly in verse 12, David spells out the logic behind this idea that God has provided everything. He says that God has provided four things for all of us. Number one is wealth. That can be money. That can be possessions. Now, you may think that, well, I went to work and I was the one who put in the 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week to make this money, so it's my money. I earned it. But as we'll see in just a moment, that isn't entirely true either. Everything we have as far as physical possessions, money, material possessions, is something that God has provided to us. Um, the second thing, he says, is honor. Wealth and honor come from you. Honor is prestige, rewards, uh, recognition, those types of things. And you may think, well, you know, I did this because I was salesman of the year, or I did this because uh, I did such a great job. And, you know, I think winning awards and things like that are tremendous. They're, they're worthy, and they do. They are something that kind of brings a sense of uh, reward to us, and, and we appreciate those things. But you know where they come from? They come from God. God's also the origin of those honors as well. You see, God controls everything that goes on, and he is the one who provides those things as well. He then goes on, and he says, you are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength. Strength is the third thing. Our physical abilities. Um, there have been, just in the last week, there have been a couple of football players who have made comments about their faith in God during an interview, and one in particular started his interview off by praising and thanking Jesus for uh, giving him the ability to do what he was doing. And the TV station, when they broadcast it, or the network, edited that out because they didn't want that to go out. Um, and that's created a little bit of tension. But we need to recognize there's truth in that. Our strength... The physical ability to work every day is something that comes from God. Now, you may work out, you may eat right, you may do a lot of different things that are good for your body, but who made your body? Who designed your body? Who is it that gives you that physical ability? It is God. And then the last one here, the power to exalt, the other abilities that provide an advantage, I, I'm calling this. Um, you may have just an incredible ability to uh, do mathematics. It's not a physical ability necessarily, but it's a mental ability. It's something that gives you an advantage in life. So God gave you that. Or God gives you, uh, you know, in, in my work, line of work, I have to be able to speak in front of people. And by the way, when I was in high school, the very first speech I gave in high school, I completely froze up out of fear and couldn't finish my speech. Teacher finally told me, David, you can go sit down. And if you'd have asked me then about becoming a pastor and for 50 years speaking in front of people, I'd have said, there's no way that's happening because I, I, I can't speak. But God has grown that ability over the years. Everything we have originates in God. It comes from Him and in His graciousness because, because verse 11 says, He is great, He's powerful, He's majesty, uh, all of these things. He is exalted above all. He designed you, the Bible says, he knit you together in your mother's womb so that you would be exactly physically the person you are. When you were still uh, in your mother's womb, God designed every day of your life. He knew that you would be in this place this morning hearing this message before you were ever born. 
That's an incredible level of provision for us. So God is the provider of everything. The second principle we need to know in order to handle our wealth or our finances is what I'm calling the contentment principle. This is a hard one to learn. The contentment principle is found in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. And uh, in Philippians 4, 11 to 13, he says, I'm not saying this, this is Paul speaking, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Now, I want to take a look at this passage of Scripture here, because what Paul is saying is something that goes way counterculture. It goes against everything that we've, we've been told or we, we've come to believe. He is saying it is more important to be content than to have lots of stuff. Because lots of stuff doesn't make us content. In fact, uh, he, as we'll see in a moment, he says the amount of stuff you have doesn't even count. Now, why is contentment important? Well, I believe contentment is important for a number of reasons. Number one is that it's the secret to enjoying what we have. It is. I have an iPhone here. And uh, this came out a year or two ago. It's a fairly recent model. But there's a new iPhone available now. This is not the newest iPhone. And I didn't have to wait all that long for a newer one to come out. Now, if I focus only on the iPhone 15, what's the problem I'm going to have here? I'm going to cease to enjoy what I've got. Never mind the fact that this thing does absolutely everything I need it to do. And I'm the kind of tech person, I'm, a, I'm kind of a nerdy geek, and, and I like tech toys. Um, I use this for an amazing number of different things, and I'm probably one of the power users uh, for this kind of a device, uh, despite my age, yes. And, uh, but this satisfies me as long as I don't have a wandering eye and look at what else I could have. Oh, that one's got a better camera. You don't use the camera. Okay. Um, but... Uh, or that one's got better this or better that. We begin to think about other things. Now, for me, it's a cell phone. Some of you, it's something entirely different. It might be a car. It might be clothes. It might be house. It might be all kinds of different things. When we begin eyeing other things and we become discontented with what we have, we stop enjoying what we have. And we can't hardly be blamed for this because one of the largest industries in the world is focused 100% on you being discontented. It is the advertising industry. Now, how often do you encounter advertising in your daily life? <laughs> Lots of times. If you're on the Internet at all, you're being bombarded multiple times a minute with, with advertising. I mean, you can't even go to a public restroom without having an advertisement in front of you. Um, they are all over the place. And what's the number one goal of advertising? To make you discontented with what you have so you'll buy what you don't have. That's the goal. And what Paul is saying here, it's the secret to enjoying what we have. Uh, contentment is also liberal, liberating from the power of materialism. Uh, as I look at the life of Paul, I can't think of a, another person that was more free from materialism than the Apostle Paul. Um, here is a guy who for most of his ministry, although he it was the number one preacher in his day, you know, uh, 
I don't know how you, you rank preachers or who would be today's number one preacher, but you know, think about the big names in preaching. My guess is some of those guys are making really big money. You know what Paul did? He made zero. Because Paul made tents as a side gig so that he could preach without burdening the people. No one more liberated from materialism than him. When we are truly content with what God has given us, the lure of other material things that we don't need or, or even want is no longer powerful in our lives. We're liberated from that. And that is an incredible thing. When we can pass by a display and say, I don't care. That doesn't attract me. Because I'm content with what I have. And when you stop and think about it, contentment is essentially saying what God has provided is enough. If God wanted me to have more, he would provide more. And that is, that is a liberating thought when we actually begin to uh, think about our, our situation. We begin to think about the things we want to have and, and we've got to spend our money on. God has given you so much money. He expects you to manage that money. And he expects you to use that in a way that is honoring to him. And one of the ways that you can honor him is to spend only the money you have on the things that you need and be content with what he provides. Paul says in this passage as well that he's learned to, the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Now, some of you are thinking, okay, I could, I could understand contentment if I live in plenty or you know, if I'm really... I've got all my needs met. And I think all of us imagine that we would be very content if we had everything that we wanted. But years ago, John Rockefeller, and this has been quoted many times, was asked, how much money is enough? This was the wealthiest man in the world by a long shot. Do you know what his answer was? How much money is enough? A little bit more. You see, he wasn't contented even then with what he had. And he could have bought and sold hundreds of people over and over and over again because he had that much. How much we have does not determine contentment. But also, Paul is saying here in the same passage, I've learned to be content even when I'm hungry or in want. Now, that's a place where it's a little bit harder for us to be contented. When we don't have the money we need, when we feel like God hasn't provided enough right now, Paul said, I learned even in those situations to be content. Now, how could he possibly be content in those situations? Well, the last verse in our passage that I just read ends with, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. In other words, he's saying, God is going to provide for me, and as God provides for me, I'm going to be able to do everything that God wants me to do. I'm going to be able to survive. I'm going to be able to meet my needs, not because I'm depending on me or I've got this great big bank account behind me, but because I've got the God of universe as my provider. And when I need it, he will provide it. And I've learned that sometimes God does not provide on our calendar. I remember when we were, I was pastor of the Hope Evangelical Free Church in Kearney, and we were a ministry to low-income families, and there's a real problem with that when it comes to the offering. Uh, if your entire congregation is making minimum wage or less, uh, your offering is not going to be sufficient. And we were in a building program, and I, my contractor came to me on Monday morning, and he said, Dave, I need a $5,000 check on Friday. 
And I looked at him, and I'm thinking this through and looking, looking at the calendar in my head, and I'm thinking, there are no offerings between Monday and Friday. I also knew that there was no way we had $5,000 in the bank account at that time. And I went through that entire week just praying, God, we've got to bring in that $5,000 by Friday. And I believe it was either Wednesday or Thursday of that week, an elderly couple came in. They'd been in a number of other times and talked to me about the ministry. And they were very interested in our ministry. And occasionally they would make a gift of maybe $100 or $200. And it was greatly appreciated. And he had some questions for me about the ministry. And I answered his questions. I gave him a little bit of a tour of the building project we were doing. And as we were saying goodbye, he said, Oh, I decided to leave an offering here too. And he handed me a folded up check. And I just took the check and I didn't even look at it at the time. I thanked him for his gift and shook hands, and he and his wife went on out to the car. I opened up the check. It was for $5,000. God doesn't always meet our timing, but he meets our needs just in time. The third principle I want to call the generosity principle. God does not ask us to give our stuff to him, but to give a small portion of his stuff to him. I'm going to go back to that First Chronicles passage and pick it up where we left off. We read verses 11 and 12. I'm going to read verses 13 and 14 now. In verse 13, he says, Now, our God, we give thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. He's referring to this offering that the people have brought for the temple. And he's saying, God, we are overwhelmed. And, and as he looked at everything that had been given, he's saying, God, we're not giving you our stuff. We're just giving you a small portion of what you've given us. And he said, he's saying, who are we that we should be able to be this generous? You see, when we understand generosity, we understand that it is not me that is giving. God has already given. He has given overwhelmingly because he's given us everything we have. And we're taking a little portion of that. When we had the dollar bills laid out up here, one of the things that struck me as I was preparing this is I only had one designated for God. And I was thinking in my mind, you know what? It just seems like it ought to be more than that. But the reality is that's all that God's asking of us. He's asking, just give back a small portion of what I've given to you. And, uh, you know, as, as I've gone through my life and as I've experienced giving to God... I've experienced that God uses giving in our lives in many ways. But I think one of the main things that God does in our lives is he uses it as a means of blessing us through giving to others. In Proverbs 11, 24 and 25, we read this. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. What he's saying here is when we are generous, when we are not greedy, when we are not hoarding our stuff, that's when God is free to bless us in incredible ways. Now, I'm not one of these health and wealth uh, preachers that says, well, you gave $10 to God, God owes you $10 back. Or God owes you more than $10 back. No. What I'm saying is that when we give, whether we give to our church or we give to others who are in need, God can then bless us. And it may not be in dollars. It may be other ways that God blesses our life. But that is the avenue by which God blesses us. And I think part of the avenue that God blesses us with is he frees us from this materialism that is got the rest of the world in its clutches. When we are open-handed with, with our money and we allow God to take some of that, 
God is also free to put some back in our hand to bless us and to bless us with other things that that may not even be financial but are probably treasured even more. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, we read, um, oops, got the wrong verse there. The, the verse uh, is the verse that says, God loves a cheerful giver. I think it's actually 2 Corinthians 9, 7. I've got the wrong reference there in your, in your bulletin. God loves a cheerful giver. God looks at our giving. He says, I want you to s- determine what you're going to set aside plan your giving, then do your giving, and do it cheerfully. Not grudgingly, not because you have to, not because you felt guilty because of what the pastor said. No, because you want to do this. Um, The last principle I call the action principle. And this is a tough one. Uh, You see, this is where we must put truth into action to see God's blessing. It seems that finances is one of those areas that sometimes we listen to it, we let it go into our mind, we say, yeah, I agree with that, and we think about it a little bit, and then we don't do anything about it. And i got to tell you, if you don't do anything about it, nothing happens. In James 1, 22 to 25... Uh, James lays out this principle, which applies to a whole lot more than our material possessions or money. But he says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Um, I kind of refer to this as the Nike principle. Just do it. Okay. Uh, Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that God gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. He's saying here you've got to put these things into practice. In other words, it's not enough to just say, I believe God is my provider. We've got to live like God is our provider. It's not enough to say I'm going to be contented. We have to actually be contented. It's not enough to say I should be generous. We have to be generous. We have to put things into practice. Now, the Bible has an awful lot to say about finances, and I could write a book about it. In fact, I have. There's one on the back table called Financial Resilience. I wrote this a couple years ago. Um, I initially wrote what's in here as a curriculum for the Crossroads Homeless Shelters. Uh, it, they're in Hastings and Grand Island, Kearney, and a number of other places are coming to Lexington. But uh, this is still their curriculum that they use uh, with people that come in there. But in the book, and there are, there's a whole stack of them on the back table, feel free to take one. Um, you know, this is, this is free day on it, okay? And... Uh, I outline four financial problems. And these four financial problems, really, if you can solve these four problems, you have your finances under control. Okay? Sounds really simple, but here they are. The first one is the income problems. This can be maybe no income if you don't have a job at all. It could be maybe not enough income. It could be maybe seasonal income. Uh, sporadic income. Uh, There's a lot of different income problems, but if you're not making enough money, you're going to have to solve that problem. And in fact, that becomes your number one problem. You have to solve this one before you can solve the next three. So that's the first one. The second one is spending problems. Now, I know none of us have this problem, but I'm just going to, for academic purposes, we'll talk about it. Uh, This is basically spending more than we make. We begin to see things that we want, and whether or not we've actually got a plan for buying that, we go ahead and buy it. If you are spending without a budget, you have a spending problem. If you're coming to the end of every month, and you've got more month than money, you've got a spending problem. You need to solve your spending problems, and I've got a number of plans uh, available for you in solving the spending problems. The third problem is debt problems. 
Debt occurs when we spend tomorrow's money today. Uh, we, there's something we really want. We can't afford it now. Well, we're willing to take out a loan, give that credit card over, whatever, so that we can buy what we want now without having to pay for it today. That eventually becomes enslaving and is, is, a, is a real problem. The last one is preparedness problems. And this is where the importance of savings comes in, saving for the future, so we're prepared for the future. Um, insurance comes under this as well and is discussed there. Retirement savings is discussed there. Uh, so all of those are preparedness issues. And all of these require action. You can't just read a book about it and think that you've got an academic solution to it. You're going to actually have to change things in order to make them, these things work. So God has given us detailed instructions here on how to handle our resources that he's given us. He has provided incredibly for us. And now it is our job to take what he's taught us, put it into practice. As we talked about last week, I, I encourage families to have an, a weekly family meeting. And maybe mom and dad need a meeting first, but this is something that is a family issue. We've got to manage our money. We've got to do what is honoring to God and do it in God's way. And it's a family thing. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? God, we thank you for the practical ways in which you have instructed us. And uh, Lord, we just uh, are encouraged uh, by the instruction that you give us, but we are also challenged by it because our hearts are not always in the right place. Lord, help us to see you as our provider and to give to you generously. This we ask in your name. Amen.